male da mare che non è mare Hi, happy Thanksgiving. This is a very special episode called Message to the Black Americans. The reason I call it that is because I have very special reasons to be thankful every year at Thanksgiving. And that is that I am adopted by black Americans. Today, I really want to talk about what it was like to come to this country, what the process was, and how it is to be from such a different world as the Nile River in Sudan, um, from an Egyptian family, the Kobolkeks, um, and to come here to a country that's so different and be raised by Africans in America who had been through slavery and survived the world's worst holocaust. Very special, special magical people who I love and would die for and just want so much in this episode to honor them. Also in this episode, we're going to be cooking umfutit. I'm going to show you the recipe for umfutit, which is, um, you call it chitlins in America. Black Americans call it chitlins, but it's an ancient Egyptian dish, um, um We're going to do the Egyptian version of it, um, and also we're going to have a salute because this is Thanksgiving, and in a Nilotic culture, you can't have Thanksgiving without a salute to fat women. And so we're going to have a special salute to fat women because, of course, it's that time of year. Whenever I tell my life story, what makes it really painful are the people who say, oh, that sounds like a movie script, it sounds like a movie plot, that can't possibly all be true, because the story of my life and how I came to America is so fantastical. And Francis Bach, who was a slave in my country, and he wrote the book Escape from Slavery, him and I became extremely good friends. And we used to talk about that, how, you know, if you put his story and my story and the story of Mindy Nazer, who is from the Kordofan region of Sudan, and so many other people from Sudan, if you put our stories together, they 
aren't so fantastic. They aren't so unique. Our stories are all very, very similar. And um, it's very painful when I talk about, you know, how I came to America. But to make a long story short, my father was Harith Ben Haril, who was an Egyptian archaeologist. Um, he felt he was a black man, but the Africans never accepted him as black. And he devoted his life to black Africans like the Dinka tribe, the Nuer tribe, the Shilluk people in South Sudan. But he was Arab. And so the people didn't want to, um, you know, he was a white Arab and he was a Kobukek, which means that he was part Turkish um, from that line of Arabs. And he wanted to have black sons, so he purchased my mother, Jitty, who was a blue-black, meaning almost charcoal-colored uh, Jidwok from the Oromo tribe. Um, they are nomadic Oromo people who travel between Somalia and Ethiopia. And he purchased my mother from her father when she was 14. Um, my father, who had always wanted to be black and wanted black sons, all six of his sons died. All six were born stillborn in a row. The seventh child that was born was me, Naima Bentadio. Um, my real name is Naima. And I lived, the seventh child, the only girl. And people where we are from in Omdurman, Sudan, um, accused my mother of witchcraft because six boys had died in a row and then the seventh child that was born was a girl. Um, I am not unique. Guess what? Writer Gail Jones had the same um, situation. She is the seventh girl after six boys. And I'm not sure, but I think someone had told me that um, I'm not sure if her brothers also died. But the famous writer Gail Jones um, has the same thing as me. So it's not so unique or impossible or, you know, the way that people always harass me and try to humiliate me and try to um, discredit my story. Um, my parents were murdered in my presence in Omdurman, Sudan, where I was born on the Nile River in Sudan. Um, which is the Arab half in North Sudan. I am not from South Sudan, although I open my show every every episode with um, a South Sudanese speaker speaking in Dinka. I am not from um, that part. Um, my parents were murdered because my Arab father spoke out against slavery in Sudan. He spoke out against the genocide that the Arab Muslims carried out against the uh, black Cushitic Sudanese tribes. I, of course, am Arab. Um, I was born a Sunni Muslim. Um, after my parents were murdered, um, and I'm leaving a lot out. If you want everything, then you can buy my book, uh, Diary of a Lost Girl, which is my autobiography. But after my parents were murdered in um, 1977 I believe after they were murdered I came I was taken to Egypt to my Egyptian family the Kobokeks Nejet Kobokek my Egyptian grandmother she you know you could she's like a Lena Horn looking person um, white Arab and she had told me that the family spent 120 years breeding the black out of the Kobokek family and therefore you know, they couldn't pass me off as the maid's daughter because I look too much like a Kobokek. I have the facial features and everything. I just came out chocolate. And so she went because uh, adoption is illegal in Egypt. She went to um, the mullahs and got permission, special permission because of my skin color to put me up for adoption. Um, UNICEF. Um, Owen McCannis, a white Irishman, which is the first time I ever saw a white person, um, they put me in his arms and he took me away from Egypt to England. Um, from there, I was placed with an Ethiopian family 
Um, I guess I was six when my parents died and I was taken away uh, from Sudan. Um, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian family didn't want me because they said I talked too much. And when they found out the way that my parents had died, then they thought she's a witch. You know, she talks too much and her parents died in a really mysterious, tragic way, so she must be a witch. And um, I'm just trying to not cry and stuff. So after all that, um, it came out that a black American man in Washington, D.C., Marvin Johnson, who um, had been a Black Panther and was now working at the Pentagon for um, on the American side, um, wanted to adopt because he heard that there was this little African girl who is in England, in London, who um, doesn't have um, parents, a family. And so he uh, talked to my Black American mother, Claudine Johnson, and they decided that, um, because they already had seven children, but they were also always taking in um, foster kids. They didn't adopt all the children they raised, because they raised really over 21, 22 children, but they adopted four of us. And I was the fourth and final adopted child. Um, in December 1978, through Owen McCannis at UNICEF and some other people who helped out, I was um, adopted and transferred to the United States from England, um, from the Ethiopian family that didn't want me. And I only spoke Egyptian Arabic. And so they brought a woman in who was like a black woman, but she, um, you know, um, looked very mixed, like she could almost be Italian, but um, in black America, they would consider her black. Well, she was my interpreter and she lived in the house with me in Washington, D.C. on Good Hope Road in Southeast Anacostia Park. Yes, I am a ghetto girl from the roughest neighborhood in Washington, D.C., but it wasn't so rough back in 1979. and coming from war-torn Sudan and watching my parents murdered in front of me and everything I had went through, um, I really, really um, saw it as a paradise, what you call the ghetto to me because I had never seen black children with shoes on. You know, it was just so shocking to me and like everyone had a car in their driveway. Um, all the people, the poorest people had a car and a TV, which to us would be like major rich in Sudan. So your poorest people who were on welfare, they had cars, TV, so it just looked rich to me. I had no idea. I couldn't understand the concept of you are, you know, still poor, you're in the ghetto. And let me just say that when I was in Sudan, living on the Nile River, helping my Arab father catch crocodiles every morning and my job was to shoot them between the eyes. Um, I didn't realize I was poor when I was barefoot and everything that we went through um, because I feel like we were rich some parts of the year and poor other parts of the year and it was just life. You know, it was just the cycle of life and how things were supposed to be. So, um, I didn't really see it as being a bad thing. I, I was happy with my life in Sudan before my parents were, you know, murdered. Um, in black America, though, the first night I was here, I saw McDonald's, you know, kids getting, I remember Doritos, the bag of Doritos. I saw a black kid come out of a store with a huge bag of Doritos. And I saw black women going to work, nurses at the bus station and like walking in their nursing uniforms. Black women with jobs, not, you know, confined to the house, but able to go out and get a job. Um, it was just really amazing and dazzling to me. My father, Marvin Johnson, picked me up from... Um, they take you through a lot because you have to get so many kinds of shots and paperwork and stuff. So I forget because I was so little. I was a little kid, but um, they picked me up from some kind of um, 
U.S. Department of something place at the airport and there were all kind of federal people there. You would think I was a movie star the way that I was brought into the country um, and all the different marshals and different people who were present and um, like I said, my own personal interpreter that the United States government paid for. I was very traumatized. I was a bedwetter from I think age six till age 19. I wet the bed. I was extremely traumatized and they immediately put me in what is called the Open Space Program at John Hopkins Hospital in Washington, D.C. I was a psychiatric outpatient from the time I arrived in 1979 until I was the age of 19. But really 17 because I ran away from home when I was 17 because the black guy, um, well, there was a black guy named Truce Harding who, his job was to teach me English, help me to, you know, be good in English. And he took my virginity and I was in love with him and everything. And so my black American parents and Nana um, were going to put him in prison. They had a big court case to put him in prison for statutory rape. And I just felt he shouldn't go to prison because he didn't rape me. I had wanted it and I felt I was grown even though I wasn't. And um, sure, he took advantage and stuff because he was older, but I just felt he shouldn't go to prison. So I ran away to, from home so that I would not have to testify against him. And I ran away to Fairfax, Virginia. And when I ran there, I won a beauty pageant, um, Miss Fire and Safety in Fairfax, Virginia. I won the beauty pageant and the fire department, oh, there was a white man named Ephraim Nelkin, who was a banker. And Ephraim became my lover and the man who took care of me, sugar daddy, really. He got me my own apartment at 17 and I had a Fiat. I didn't even have a driver's license and he brought me a Fiat car. And um, that began my life, I guess, as being um, on the run with men, basically. And being, um, you know, I should have been writing back then, but I wasn't, I was so into men. And the men, you know, I was over six foot three and really skinny and, and had a certain kind of figure that fashion people like. And so the men convinced me that I should be a model. And so that's what I did. I went to um, Tel Aviv, Israel in 1994. First of all, my black American father fought for my citizen citizenship. And in 1993, I became an American citizen. Then I went to... Um, that was in 93. Then in 94, after I became an American citizen, I left the United States and went to Tel Aviv, Israel and became a model. Um, like I said, I'm leaving out a whole lot of stuff um, because, you know, you can get my autobiography, Diary of a Lost Girl, to really get all the details. But the main thing that I'm saying here is that if it wasn't for black American people, I would be dead. I mean, they saved my life. That is my tribe now. Many black American people complain about the way I talk, certain comments that I make, um, you know, <laughs> criticism that I have of self-hating people who hate our blackness and, and just, you know, it's just hard to explain what I'm trying to say, but there's a lot of black American people who have accused me of hating black Americans. You know, she thinks she's better than us because she's African. That's total camel shit. Total camel shit. I would die for black American people. That's why I'm always in your face. That's why I'm always hanging around you. That is why I'm always criticizing and being involved with you. People who don't love you and don't care about you will just ignore you, which is what most Africans do because you're strangers to them, that you're so different, they don't understand. You know, you're weird to African people. So most of them stay clear of uh, black Americans. But I was raised by you. I was taken in by you. You saved my life. You nursed me back with love from mental distress, 
after seeing my parents murdered in front of me, after finding out that I was vaginally um, infibulated, which I didn't know until my black American mother uh, gave me a bath. That's how I found out that I was vaginally infibulated. You know, um, black American people are responsible for Cola Booth. They have made me outspoken. I am not your typical village girl. I would not be talking the way I talk and being so confrontational and being so loud if I had not been raised by sassy black American women like my mother and my aunts, um, my aunt Zola. <laughs> People who read my autobiography know about my aunt Zola because honey, she will tell your ass in a minute, honey. And, you know, my grandmother, um, my nana, Glodine, and God, so many black American people, Uncle Bidwis, Uncle Bowie, Washington, D.C., Anacostia Park, all my, you know, so much love and just so much luck. I was so lucky to be placed with a loving black family, you know, who was patient with me because I couldn't understand English, they couldn't understand Arabic. Um, it was a very difficult transition, but at the same time, it was so fascinating to them to me, it was more like being in the twilight zone, being, you know, they were just so different from African people, that yet black Americans look so much like Africans. It's hard to explain from an African standpoint because, of course, to black Americans, they're just normal. They have their culture, they have their ways, how they live and talk and do everything. So to them, they are just the normal people. We're the weird ones. But um, to me, it took years to get used to light-skinned people, um, to get used to women talking in public on the street loud, um, talking on the bus, and just so much stuff that black Americans do. Um, it's really Western culture is what I'm saying. They are so Westernized, and so now so am I. I am now that Western African girl who was raised in America, who's very Americanized. But what I'm saying here before we, you know, go to break is that I love black American people so much. The work I do is to get a message to them about a message about who we really are, about our souls and our worth and the love that we should have for ourselves and for each other. The unity that we should have that we don't have. As an African woman who black American people saved my life, they are responsible for me being beautiful and happy and strong and powerful and successful. They did that by giving me everything. Um, I feel I owe them the truth. And that truth that I owe them is the truth of who we are, what we're about, and what we're supposed to be doing in this country. Um, the love that we don't, we don't have and that we don't express and how lost we are. Black Americans will say that, oh, they're lost because of slavery, but they don't understand that black people worldwide are lost. All of us are lost globally. It's the whole planet of black people who have been dissected, removed from our own path, and almost destroyed, almost destroyed. So I think it's very special that I was brought to America I think it's very special that an Egyptian, Sudanese American, Oromo, Nilotic girl um, <laughs> got to come here and, 
and be a part of black America and, and, and have a message for black America. And um, I just love black American people. And that is what I want to say is Thanksgiving is um, thank you so much. That is what I'm thankful for are the black American people. That's what I'm thankful for. I have a special poem that I have to read. Many of you remember my book, Nile River Woman. You remember it. It was one of my first books that was released in the United States. It's my poetry collection. And from it, I want to read a very special poem called Thanksgiving Day. And this poem has become a tradition in my black American family. We read this poem every year before dinner. And so um, before I show you how to make um fatik, which are Egyptian chitterlings, and before we have our special salute to fat women, I just want to um, read this poem called the from my book, Nile River Woman, here's my poem, Thanksgiving Day. I make no sound but a heartbeat. I take no liberties with the devil, nor do I smoke his dandruff or cut his pathways because life is much too hard. And I love the slow pace of my God and the cornered grins of my ghosts. I love the act of will. I savor the days of the earth. I love the height of the sky. I cherish every black man with an unheard sorrow because our graves are just the same. And I live for the echo of my children listening for the bolt with the silent faith with the silent faith that they have in me with the silent faith that they have in me I make no sound but a heartbeat this year I've made six turkeys, three hams, two legs of lamb, macaroni and cheese, Mediterranean cornbread, American soul food cornbread, um, collard greens with ham hocks, special black eyed peas with sausage and mushroom soup, um, sweet potato pies, sakatumi cake, Russian cherry cake, Jewish food because of Jason, kugel, um, of course challah bread, um, matzo ball soup. We just got so much of the foods that you're used to. But today I'm going to show you an ancient recipe from the Kamambo region, um, the Aswad southern Egyptian um, region, very ancient dish which is called um fatit. Nowadays, because Egypt is now mostly Arab Muslims, a lot of people re replace the pork intestines with sheep stomach. <clears throat> but um, we are going to have the real authentic um fatit with pork intestines and sheep stomach. And um, I don't usually eat this the way I'm going to make it for you right now. But I want you to see the authentic way that um fatit is made. Because for one thing, this plant right here, it's called malakia. You don't have this plant in America. It's a cross between collard greens and okra in one plant. I don't like how slimy okra is, so that's why I don't like malakia. And usually in Egypt, we make it in a soup. <laughs> Today, though, I'm going to tell you step by step how we're going to um, make this dish. Also, um, every Thanksgiving, only on that day once a year, I make candied bacon in the morning for my sons. And so really quickly, let me tell you how to make candied bacon. You take 
a slab of bacon and on each piece of bacon you're going to put a thin coat on both sides of peanut butter. Then you're going to put a little bit of honey and a little bit of corn syrup and cover it in brown sugar and bake it in the oven. And I gave my sons that this morning um, on Thanksgiving Day <laughs> along with um, my famous cheese eggs, scrambled cheese eggs, um, candied bacon, and Coop's bread. Coop's bread is a kind of Arabic bread that um, I eat. And we also have challah bread now that we have Jason, which is a Jewish bread. And I love challah bread. It's the best bread on earth. <clears throat> Um, before we get into the step-by-step -step of making um petite, let me just um, show you this beautiful tradition from Nilotic culture. Um, this box right here, I made this wooden box and this is where we keep, um, well it's called a Sejil de Maya. And this is where we keep the de Maya Anta Semenati which is uh, Egyptian Arabic for the fat woman doll. And in Nilotic culture, and, and understand Nilotic means people who live on the Nile River. There are about 80,000 different Nilotic tribes um, who live on the Nile River. Um, and that's eight to nine countries. And the majority of us have some type of way of celebrating fat women because in most Nilotic countries and cultures and things we don't have um, fat women anymore but in ancient times um, almost all the poems and songs reference the fattest woman in the village. The fattest woman in the village meant that she was the richest woman, the healthiest woman, taken good care of by the men so she was well fed and, and therefore fat and her fat kept everyone warm. Um, she had healthier babies so that was a big thing in ancient Cushitic cultures was um, this thing for the fat woman. We don't really have fat women anymore in, in Nilotic cultures um, but this is my crypt for my yearly fat woman doll and you cannot open it until Thanksgiving Day. That's part of the tradition because she goes on the table. When you put the turkey and this is how it is at my house, we put the turkey, candles, macaroni and cheese, potato salad, all the normal foods, cranberry sauce, sweet potato pies and on my at my house we only play jazz music. We only play jazz music on Thanksgiving Day. So I play John Coltrane and, you know, there's a song by Diana Ross that we play every year called Brown Baby Save the Children, which is her singing sort of a jazz song written by Marvin Gaye. <laughs> and, um, you know, but that's the kind of music that we play. That's the kind of atmosphere that we have. And then on the table, we have the... Um, the Maya Anta Seminati, which is the fat woman doll, to, um, you know, I don't know how to explain it. It's not a religious ornament or anything like that. It's just that you're not supposed to eat until you have put her on the table and opened the uh, crypt and whatever you know you're going to say to the ancestors, you have said it to the ancestors, and then in the presence of the fat woman doll, everyone can drink and eat and be merry. And so that is how in a Nilotic culture and every Thanksgiving my sons are so used to it. And now Jason, who thinks it's hilarious, but we've taught him to worship fat women. <laughs> and so we have our fat woman doll. Okay, let's get into making step by step um petit, which is the ancient Egyptian way that chitterlings were made. And um petit, that word itself pretty much means guts. So you're going to take your chitterlings and clean them really good. Whatever your way of doing it is, that's how you're going to do it. You know, you want to clean them thoroughly to where they're really clean. Then what I do is I take the chitlins and I put them in a big pot 
with apple juice, brown sugar, and salt. That's salt, apple juice, and brown sugar. And that is just for them to brine for four to five hours. They're not going to cook in that. They're just going to brine in the apple juice, salt, and brown sugar for about four to five hours. Okay, once that's done, I take a pressure cooker because in a pressure cooker, instead of taking six hours to boil the chitterlings, it's only going to take 90 minutes in a pressure cooker. To make sure that you don't have any odor, you know, because they can smell really bad. And a pressure cooker cuts down on the odor enormously. But what I also do to help the pressure cooker cut down on the odor is I add at least two to three potatoes. And as you can see here, I've cut some potatoes. And the potatoes are going to go into the pressure cooker with the chitlins. And that's going to cook for 90 minutes. No bad smell. And, um, excuse me. Okay. Now, after they're done, this is where the easy part comes in, but it's also where you have to remember something. So, okay, we've got the malakia that we talked about, chopped, which is like greens. You don't boil this. You're going to put this into the stir fry, crispy and, you know, not cooked. So the malakia is not going to be cooked. You've got a stir fry pan, or you can use a regular skillet. Um, you can use peanut oil is what they usually use um, and some types of olive oil in Egypt and um, I'm making the Egyptian version not the Moroccan version where they use duck fat so as you can see my skillet has the peanut oil I am going to add the chitlins and then the two main important ingredients in this dish are honey and very very hot spicy chili peppers green and red chili peppers that I've chopped up and so um, also you can put coconut and pineapple I'm not gonna put any coconut and pineapple this time but here we go we're gonna put in the honey we're gonna put in our chili peppers hot chili peppers and then we're going to put in our malak malakia, which will cook and be kind of crispy and give it a nice crunch. Um, this is the most delicious dish. You just will be amazed at how delicious this tastes. The key is the honey and plenty of chili peppers because what you want is for it to be, when you put it in your mouth, it tastes sweet at first. But then as you chew it, it burns the hell out of you. But it tastes so good. And the chitterlings are just so delicious. Um, the malakia gives you this nice crunch and gives you some vegetables. Um, for people who like okra, of course the malakia is okra and collard greens together in one plant. And um, you can go online and find um, African um, stores that will ship it to you. Um, you can get malakia from Africa. Uh, from Egypt and Ethiopia and places like that. Okay, now that the dish is done, we're going to take the sheep stomach that I sauteed in butter and garlic. And the sheep stomach, you're just going to lay that out in the platter. And then you're going to put your umfotit over the sheep stomach. And there you have it, umfotit. It is so delicious. I mean, we're going to eat some in a minute. But before we eat the umfotit, first we have to honor the fat woman. Um, this is just part of Nilotic culture. Um, I am the fattest woman in the village. I am the mother of the river. I am the one who walked to Zara, to Sunda, to Kara, to Sheba to Anna. I am the fattest woman in the village. I am the one who gave birth to Tan, to Nok, to Nol, to Bahi, 
to Zina, to Karaka, to Elda, Ifra, Zondo. I am the fattest woman in the village. I am the one who ate the sun. I am the one who walked into the valley and was bitten by no scorpion but rain down the good luck of the crow and brought up the lilies and brought up the children and milked all my children. My breasts are filled with milk and honey. I am the fattest woman in the village. I am the song in the eyes of all the elderly. I am the remembrance and the passion and the love of all the lovers who have ever been. I am the one who brought us to this place, to Zanga, to Nutu, Tiaka. I am the one who have given you at Moro and Zapata the rising of the temple stone and the building of the first Kushite pyramids. I am the fattest woman in the village. My love is your love. My dearest and my dearest of all. My dearest and my dearest of all. I am the fattest woman in the village. And now we can eat and, oh God, this is so damn good. <laughs> this is some good ass food. You must try um fatit. I mean, you are just gonna love it. The sh no, trust me, it's really hot. It's spicy hot, but it's also very sticky sweet, meaty, and just so delicious. Now that we have given honor to the fattest woman in the village, we can eat, drink, and be merry. I love you so much for supporting me. I love you so much for supporting me, for caring about me, for watching my blog, for reading my books. I'm Cola Booth, and I just want to say on behalf of myself and my whole family, we wish you such a beautiful and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>